So for our first speaker, uh, Natasha Lazareski. Uh, Dr. Natasha Lazareski is an occupational health specialist and an expert in psychosocial risk management. She has helped a wide range of organisations, including personal insurance agencies, workers' compensation and government institutions, to successfully develop sustainable risk management strategies and holistic health frameworks. Natasha's uh, presentation title today is Organisational Approach to Mental Health and Importance of Building a Resilient Workforce. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, is this mic working? Yeah, you can all hear me. Um, it's, it's, thank you, Pam, for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, um, it's so good to see uh, lots of people also um, online joining us. Um, so let me see if this clicker is working. I, I like walking around, so I will be walking around and talking, um, and probably talking to you as well. What I'm going to do is... Um, um, uh, talk a little bit about um, what actually uh, is mental health and why we have issues that we have at workplace and what workplace can do about it and what we can do for ourselves. So if the main presentation comes up, do I need just to press the button? Okay, so um, I am um, sorry. Oh, it's okay. But um, talking about resilience. <gasps> <laughs> Let's stretch. Is this coming up or? Okay, well, I'll just start talking and then you can just imagine that there is a slide there. Um, the, the importance of mental health um, at work, everyone is talking about mental health, but what I usually do is go back to talking about, you know, um, a, what are the psychosocial risks and what does that actually mean? How does work um, impact our health? And in talking, in talking about that, I usually ask people, you know, do you actually know how our mind works and, and you know, how we as a human actually behave and why we behave in a certain way? Um, because we are actually the main force of the workplaces. Even the decision makers are actually humans <laughs> behaving in a certain way because they're driven by their mind. Even, you know, the company that we call a company is a group of people that make decisions that we hate <laughs> in certain uh, instances. And they usually make decisions because they've been driven by their mind to do something because they're unsure about something. They are anxious that they're making a mistake or someone else will make a mistake. So they actually create an environment that sometimes is actually impacting the whole workforce. Yay, thank you. That's great, good work. <laughs> so, um, so what I usually talk about is, um, you know, let's learn about what our mind works and how our mind works and very quickly people actually come up with hey this is how the workplace is impacting me because this is how my mind works so um, in 30 minutes um, I already lost five so I'll try to do to talk about what is the mental health, um, what are the psychosocial risks and actually understanding them, what are the controls that we can, uh, what is resilience and that's part of the controls that we actually have to put in place. I will talk about a little bit about shift work because it's very important uh, for your environment to understand how, how does that risk impact uh, your health and also holistic approach to well-being. So understanding that one initiative that you may you know, put in place to control one risk is not going to work. So how are we actually going to embed all of the initiatives? And how are we actually creating a workplace that we are actually living the well-being? We are actually living a good life at work rather than having a well-being initiative at work. Um, what I usually hate saying is, um, you know, work-life balance. It sounds like we're not living when we're at work. We're actually doing something very important. We're actually living our most important values when we're at work. We're actually living and doing something really, really important in our life. So um, I usually try to say that we are actually um, uh, having a work fun balance rather than work life balance. Um, so I'm going to try not to bore you. I, I guess everyone understands what the stress is and what stress looks like. Um, hands up if you do. 
<laughs> yeah. So I'm not going to try to talk about what stress is and what stress isn't, but I'm going to start talking about more a strategic um, um, view of, of what the organizational mental health is and what does it mean. So what we're talking about and what we're usually seeing is the long-term consequences of being exposed to psychological or psychosocial risk at workplace. And that is usually mental health issues, behavioral issues, cognitive issues, or uh, physical issues. Very often we have a, um, a, you know, a musculoskeletal or cardiovascular issues. So what is causing it is, is um, presented in organizational risk. And organizational risk is usually your job design, um, the way how we, you know, um, work and how we organize a job and how we interact with each other, um, you know, how long our work shifts and whether we work uh, longer hours or not. So interpersonal relationship is actually uh, considered to be a, one of the highest risks in the workplace organization, you know. Um, hands up who, who went to work and came back home saying, I can't believe I'm working with this person. You know, we all have that person that we just can't stand. You know, so, so it's normal. And because we're human, it, it just happens to us. So those are the organizational risks, how the organization are actually setting up the policies and procedures. How you actually, you know, how do you organize your shift if you are having a shift work, you know? Are you actually looking at new latest researches as what they're saying about the shift work and what are need to be done? Um, and homework interference. And then we have individual risk. And individual risk are actually about us, you know? gender, um, you know, our personal health, the way we, we, we interact with, in, with our internal world, which is, you know, what's in my mind and my resilience, but also, um, you know, other age um, and other issues that may come up with us. So, and depending on those, you know, background and individual risk, um, we are actually uh, going to um, have a certain those are not supposed to be question marks, just bullet points, but it just happens to be. So we are actually responding um, in different way to stressful reactions. So each person will respond a different way to a stressful reaction that we have at workplace. Now, all organizations, all workplaces are going to have something, some of these, and people are going to differently react to it based on what are the individual, um, you know, um, um, uh, risks that we have. And what is, is then um, doing is, is actually providing us with, with the different outcomes in the long-term exposure. So some of us may consider themselves resilient and actually be in, a, in a, an environment that is quite, you know, working long hours, long shifts, being exposed. I, I work with Ambulance Victoria and I had this general manager telling me, well, I went through long shifts and I worked 14 hour shifts and look at me, I'm okay, this young generation is just too soft. You know, they need to toughen up. Have you heard that before? Yeah, do you think the same? I think that, that about my 19 year old daughter. But um, the question is, there is also what we call a background. We call a backdrop, you know. We, there is also a social environment. There is also a different, you know, call different age, different uh, financial environment um, that's affect, affecting us. And, and that's, uh, you know, contributing factors to anything. So one day in the morning, I will be okay with my daughter taking three hours to get ready, deciding what to wear because I don't have a meeting to hurry to, I don't have any other issues at work. So I can actually deal with her and say nicely, I appreciate you need you know, time to get dressed, but let's go. And sometimes I do actually have a very important meeting. I'm already stressed and I'm not going to say nicely, let's get dressed. I'm going to say, hurry up, I can't wait for you anymore. Yeah, so that's the backdrop. So it depends on that backdrop, where it's our family situation, where it's our background, you know, what's happening in our financial institution um, at home, um, we are actually going to have a different response to different risks in the workplace. Yeah? Okay, so let's go to internal risk. How many of us know how, how our brain is wired? Yeah? Well, we all have the same wires, and let me tell you, they're all wired differently. <laughs> you know, my one is usually like this. <laughs> but, um, you know, the understanding how our brain is wired and how we develop is very important to understand how we develop, how we actually respond to the organizational risks and what are the controls that you need to put in place so that you actually protect your staff and yourself. So, 
if we are actually um, believing in the theory of evolution and, and not um, you know, the, um, the Bible theory, um, what we are going to, to talk about is how our brain developed a millennium ago. So we basically developed from this guy. The Homo sapiens species are the only Homo species that actually um, survived. There were Homo erectus and um, I'm not sure what are the others. Um, there is the Asian um, Homo uh, species. But anyway, the Homo sapiens, we, we developed from Homo sapiens. They're the only one that survived. And why they survived is because the brain developed in such a way to actually protect us and to keep us alive. So the only purpose of the brain at that time was what? To keep us alive. So if this man was absolutely optimistic person who, when they walked by the bush where there was a noise, went in and said, ah, oh, this is just a squirrel, let's see, they would be eaten by lions, wouldn't it? So this brain was developed to be a pessimistic brain, to always look for danger. So if there is a noise in the bush, what would this brain do? Say, don't go there. There may be something that's going to eat you. So we basically developed from the, this guy who was Mr. Pessimistic guy, yeah? So what we're doing every time we go somewhere, we scan for a danger. We're looking whether there may be a lion there because we need to run away. What also that brain learned to develop is to re retain the knowledge when they actually survived interaction with the lion, they actually retained the knowledge of how they did it. And the brain keep reminding them how they did it so they can actually repeat it again. So if we actually find ourselves in a very threatening situation, what is our brain going to do is remember that situation and bring it back over and over again so we actually know how to protect ourselves and not go there. How many of you have been sitting at 3 a.m. in the morning thinking about a mistake that you made the day before and the silly thing you said, why did I say this, oh my God. You know, so the brain is saying, don't make that mistake again, don't do it again, because it may be a life threatening. So at that time, we actually survived um, as well because we managed to maintain the species by surviving, by, by you know, um, having a, um, sorry, that goes there and by also belonging to the group. So in order for Homo sapiens to, su to survive, what we managed to do is we managed to organize ourselves in a larger group. We managed to actually strategize. So when an enemy comes, we actually managed to organize ourselves and to uh, strategize how to work together to actually um, you know, uh, beat the enemy. And also, if something didn't work, this time, we learn how to change it so it works next time. So as a Homo sapiens, we need to actually have a purpose with a group together to work together towards the common goal in order to actually survive. So in the workplace, if you think about it, if you have a group that has a common purpose that actually bonds them together, I know what I'm doing this and why I'm doing this, they're going to be working much better with a group that doesn't have a common purpose, that don't belong to the purpose, don't prescribe to the purpose, and don't understand what my role in this group is and why am I doing it. Because that's, that's how we survive. We need to actually work towards something common. We need to work together. The other thing that our brain does, our brain actually constantly scans whether we belong to the group. Because what would have happened to this homo sapien guy if he didn't belong to the group? He would be alone and he will be eaten by lions, isn't it? So our, our prime brain, what it does, it looks every time we actually go to the workplace, whether we belong to the group, whether I'm matched to the group. Like for me here now, standing up here, I don't belong to the group. I don't feel I belong to the group. So I will have a little bit of anxiety coming in because I'm thinking, oh my God, did they get me? <laughs> did they like me? <laughs> you know? So that's normal feeling that comes. It comes every time when we're going somewhere because of this. Because if we didn't have that feeling, if we didn't know that, if we didn't scan for it, we wouldn't survive. We wouldn't be here. Okay? Um, so there is a one more thing that we have different from, um, from other mammal species and animals, and that is that we have a prefrontal cortex. We have a higher thinking. So if you think about it, we have a reptile brain that's telling us run away when something is really scary or freeze um, or drop dead. 
Um, there is another mammal brain that is telling us, you know, um, there's kind of this brain that creates attachments and controls all our um, uh, body uh, metabolism. And, you know, at the moment for me now, it raises a level of cortisol because I'm feeling a little bit stressed and anxious. So my heart is racing up. And it's, so that's the mammal brain. And then we have a prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain, which is the newest, latest development, probably about 500,000 years ago. And that prefrontal cortex, every time your cortisol level is up, is thinking, where, what does this mean for me? It's pre creating a context of how am I actually feeling about this? So when your mother is telling you off, that prefrontal cortex remembers that feeling. And when you come to work and your boss is telling you something, you get the same feeling. You've been told off and your prefrontal cortex is placing you like this. You feel this little, don't you? You know, someone told you off, someone is telling you that, you know, you don't know enough. Monkeys don't have that. So they don't have that feeling. They're not thinking, where do I belong now in this group if someone tells me off? We do. And that's very important for bullying and harassment. That's very important for the way we talk to people at home and people at workplace. Because as soon as your voice is changing, as soon as you, you, you know, you're having that attitude, kind of, I know more than you do, I'll tell you, our brain is connecting to, to when my mother told me off, when I was punished about something, and I'm feeling this little, and therefore, I'm not going to feel good about it. Yeah, so that, that's, that's how our brain works. The other thing is that we need to have a social interaction, myth and purpose, but also the homo sapiens species are the only ones, and that's why we survive, who can actually create a gossip. So people, I go to workplaces and they usually say, we have a gossip, I want you to get rid of the gossip. You can't get rid of the gossip because that was a survival instinct. If I, I don't need, as a homo sapiens, I don't need to be in front of a person who is bad to decide whether the person is bad or not. If someone comes to me and says, um, you know, Donald Trump is saying such and such, such thing, you know, and I heard of him, I'm going to make a decision that I don't like what Donald Trump does, and I'm not going to like him, yeah? We are, we are you know, and that's homo sapiens. So I don't need to be in front of the shotgun to be experiencing the fear of a shotgun because I know that's, that's bad. So that's how we develop. So the gossip at workplaces is normal. The thing we need to create is a good gossip. We need to create a gossip that is binding us together with the same purpose. Why are we here? And if you're in a health environment, you're doing something so important for a community and for people you're touching. Yet we have people that are really disengaged and people and we have you know environment that are uh, you know lots of incivility in some areas and that is because you're losing a purpose why are we here together what are we doing we're doing something very important we're living our values because we're doing something that's importantly deeply important to myself but also to the community and as a group we believe in the same thing so if you have a ceo sitting next to to you and footy match, you're going to be talking to them okay. You're going to, you know, you're not going to think I'm talking to the CEO. We're going for the same team. We're going to connect because we are connecting on a social plane. What we do in organizations, we put the barriers because someone is above me. We're creating, you know, that, um, that barrier that we are actually not working um, as a group, as a team. So what we need to do in the workplace is we actually need to connect on a social level. We need to connect on we're doing something together meaningful. Otherwise, you're going to have that feeling of I'm this little and you're this big. Um, and that's the normal development of our brain. So if you look at our brain, the uh, shift work, when we talk about shift work, this part of the brain that I call like a central um, a central server um, here is actually controlling most of the responses. And that part of the brain, uh, brain is also co controlling our, our uh, clock, which tells us when to sleep and when to not, not to sleep. So, um, you know, depending on the light going in, that, that brain is going to trigger around and also controls so many things about our body, how we feel, you know, what are the hormones that are uh, metabolism that works. The prefrontal cortex is this part, and that part is our thinking part. And that's very important because, you know, that part is also bringing out self-awareness about who am I and how I behave. 
who am I, how I behave, how actually I behave towards others and how others behave. We very often have a picture in our head that is actually formed by not not engaging this part of the brain, but actually just reacting with memo. That I, the picture I have about myself in my head at the moment is completely different to what each of you have about me. Yeah? And so you may think about me as this weird woman with a weird accent, uh, you know, talking. I have a picture about me as, you know, weird woman with a weird accent talking to you, obviously, because I just told you what I think. But anyway, we all have this little story in our head, and what we do is we usually behave aligned with what our mind is telling us without actually being able to say, stop back and see what's going on, be able to um, diffuse or unhook from what's in our internal story and see how we are actually perceived by someone. Now, if someone is, has a narcissistic trait, what is going to happen? These people, this person is going to think that they're great. Everything is fantastic. They actually look really good. Like this um, a little man here, I don't, I don't know whether you can see it. They look in the mirror, they think I'm fantastic. Am I great? Look, I'm presenting so well. Yet everyone is also looking like, uh uh, this is not what it looks like. So that's why it's important to be connected with the prefrontal cortex. And what we call that is mindfulness. Yeah? So if you hear about mindfulness, it means that you're connecting and you're, you're actually aware of yourself and aware of others. Um, now, um, as I said, we were in, in um, olden times really developed so we can survive when we face the lions. What we're doing uh, today, what today presents a really threat to us is our managers, our workplaces. So when you go into workplace and something is really happening and you see managers connecting together and going into a meeting room, which is unusual, you're not going to think, oh, great, I'm getting a pay raise. I'm getting a better job. This is fantastic. No, you're getting, oh, my God, something is going on. I may lose a job, yeah? So that's because we are pessimistic brain. We are never going to look for something great. We're always going to think something bad is happening. And so when we are actually leaders in the workplace, we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of how we're communicating because lots of and lots of stressful events are happening from you know, not managing a change, not managing communication. Change management is terrible in today's work environment. People are actually communicating change only when they actually make the decision, which actually makes us feel um, threatened. You know, we don't know what's going on. Um, so, as a result of all of that, our, our brain is like a radio doom and gloom, constantly messaging, you know, the problems that have been in the past and the problems in, that you may actually see in the present and the problems that you can actually uh, think of happening in the future. And what we do is we're trying to avoid them by coping. Some of those are really good coping mechanisms and some of them are bad coping mechanisms. So, that's the normal reaction. What happens to us when we go into the circle of coping with the bad mechanisms, we're actually developing a mental illness. So if we don't have a good coping skills to deal with the stress uh, situation, we're actually developing a mental illness. Um, and so what I like to do is we're coming down to what resilience is then. So what is resilience? So, you know, when I ask people about what they think resilience is, they think it's someone who can actually cope with a stressful situation and move on. And I can describe you about, you know, 20 narcissistic managers that they deal with, that they can say they're very resilient. You know, they usually are able to walk over the co-workers and get on top of the stressful situation, yeah. But what I call a resilience and what we call a resilience is ability to initiate and sustain a value-guided action. And it means that, um, you know, in a situation which are really tough, in a situation that are really challenging, you're able to actually deal in life and en enjoy life still and live the life to full and take a value-guided action. So you're going to, you know, it's, um, it's like Rosie Betty. Has anyone heard of Rosie Betty? You know, the, 
that's resilience. It, she's still struggling. She still has a depressive symptoms, but she's doing something really meaningful. She's not, you know, she's not, um, uh, uh, she, she hasn't closed herself up. She's actually doing something meaningful and, and she's, um, she's still living life to the full and doing something really value guided and taking action. Um, so in line with that, um, what we, we're talking about is that life is difficult. We are all going to go through this. Even when you're having a new relationship, something is going to happen and that person is going to trigger a reaction. <laughs> you know, babies. How many of you have kids? You know, they're cute when they're babies. When they're 19, you want to kill them. Um, but, you know, that's what life is. It comes with goods and bads. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? Are we going to hook with the bads and then have a really bad response to it and go on against it and deal, deal, with, deal with things like that? Or are we going to unhook from it and do things that are really, really um, in, enhancing our life? Um, so learning resilience means being able to unhook from the negative thoughts and feelings, to unhook from this is bad story, this person is bad, you know, life is bad, and actually be able to live the life to full and move on and engage with, with and, and understanding what is the purpose, what we want to stand for. So building a management resilience, building a management that is very resilient in this sense will actually start setting up the environment and workplace that is positive and that is good and that's healthy. You know, if I'm in a manager being able to see myself and perceive my, react, my actions from someone else's perspective, being able to accept that feeling that comes with anxiety and feelings of worry and anger when someone is telling me, hey, you've done something wrong and say, okay, let's talk about it. Being able to actually see what are the decisions I'm making and how they're affecting another person is going to start creating an environment that is actually building that healthy and happy workplace. Um, so the other thing, and I think um, we already heard about that, what our brain is very good at doing is, is doing this to ourselves. You know, we, we treat ourselves really badly. We tell to us, our mind tells us things that we wouldn't say to people we love. You know, my mind tells me so often, you suck, your accent is terrible, people don't understand you, you know, you're not good enough, you need to do better. You know, how often your mind tells you something like that? And it's normal. What we need to learn is we need to learn self-kindness. We need to start doing more of this to ourselves and others. Because the research is saying that carers, that have a high level of self-kindness and high level of self-doubt are the best carers because they have, they're actually able to look after themselves and they, they have a self-doubt so they're going to learn more and more and they're going to be better. Carers that have a low level of self-kindness and high level of self-doubt, what happens to those people? They're constantly doubting they can't do anything and they're really tough on themselves. They keep telling themselves a bad story about themselves and they're actually getting really stressed. They're not good carers. Carers that have a high level of self, um, you know, um, care and high level and low level of self doubt, that's, we're not going to talk about them. They're obviously not doing quite well. Um, so the important thing is to learn is the self-care and care for others. What do I want to, how do I want to treat myself and how do I want to treat others in this situation? So, you know, in the organization, very often they implement so many good initiatives for people. They will have, you know, um, help checks. They will have EAP programs and everything. The participation is so little because sometimes they're saying our oh, people are doubting that we want to help them or people don't contact them. That's because we don't use what we have because we are not resilient enough to understand what is it in for me? Why would I care after myself? What, how can I care after myself? And that's important to learn. So that's the individual risk, understanding who we are and how we work. Now external organizational risk, I'm not going to talk about it a lot because I think I probably reached uh, my time. But 
Um, we're going to talk about um, the, um, the most important one for you, and that is the work schedule, which is your um, shift work, night shifts, inflexible work schedules and unpredictable hours. Um, now, um, those are really um, high level risk everywhere in the world. So everywhere I worked and worked in many, on many continents, um, the healthcare has the, the highest risk from the shift work. Not just because you're working long hours and affecting, in, and it's affecting individual, but the impact on the community, the impact on decision making, the impact on, on you know, errors that there may, um, the impact of your errors that make is really high. So um, I'll, uh, we have a great um, new technology here, um, compliments of Pam. So I would ask you, we have some few quiz questions. Are you ready, Pam? Um, so we, you all have this um, in front of you. And um, so um, it's kind of a digital um, quiz, whatever it's called. What is it called? Polling, digital polling. Po digital polling system. So what we're going to have, we have a few quiz questions we, uh, for you and um, each of these numbers correspond to the number of one, two, three or four, the options on the screen. So the first, are we ready? So the first question is um, how many Australians um, are doing a shift work at the latest research? What do you think? 700,000, 5 million, 1.5 million are 560. Are we ready? Pam? No pressure? I saw, is this the polling? Have you guys pressed the what do you think? Sorry. Oh, okay, so you have 15 seconds to press now. Please. This is like Eurovision. <laughs> and Germany is voting. <laughs> okay, so what did we get? Yeah, 1.5 million is correct. Did anyone read that research? Yeah? you cheating. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 1.5 million. And it's... Um, it's an increase, um, so 16% of the population is working shift work, which is, which is huge. Um, can we go back to my presentation, please? So the increase of the shift work from in the last 20 years, there is a, a, a huge increase in the shift work in Australians. So we have increased shift work, so you'll be going through the monkeys again, I'm sorry. Um, so we have increased in shift works. The other thing is that we have um, also increased the hours that we're working. Um, we have a um, um, increased, um, so more people are, are reporting that they're actually leaving work without finishing the work for the day. So which means, how many of you have left work thinking, great, I'm starting from scratch tomorrow? No? You see, well, um, you know, that's also, that's also um, increasing the stress, you know, because um, you're going to go to bed thinking about what I need to do tomorrow, what I need to do tomorrow. So um, there is a huge, um, huge increase on, um, um, uh, from, from um, up to 68% of people reporting that they go home without feeling that they have completed the work for the day, um, which, is, um, which is a lot. So um, the, the risk at workplace um, is the latest study so on the 32 to 36% of people, um, of workers fall asleep at work once a week, the shift workers. And that's 10% more. So uh, risk of occupational health uh, yeah, accidents is 60% um, higher in shift workers than, um, than non-day shift workers. Um, and the, um, 
the research is finding that you know all the other conditions, the cardiac metabolic diseases that we call so you know diabetes and cardiac disease is higher in shift workers. There is also research showing that the night shift worker is is um, also increasing risk for um, for pregnancy. Um, there is non-conclusive uh, research about the breast cancer in females and and so on and so. So um, the there is a shift work. The sleep disorder. How many of you have heard that sleep shift work sleep disorder? Yeah. So it's it's higher in the 10% uh, higher in in the night shift population. And the problem we have is the behavior and and and, how, um, and the psychological related morbidity morbidity. So what happens because of um, because our um, circadian rhythm is is, you know, if you remember that brain, because of that rhythm is actually destroyed or, or desynchronized, what's happening to us, it actually throws all our body balance um, out of balance. And it, one of those things that you can observe at workplace is, you know, impaired decision making. Um, you know, you will find people that are lacking a tolerance, you know, and you don't really know what is coming. People are becoming difficult, like, you know, that person is so difficult, I can't deal with them anymore. Well, in fact, they, they have been working in shift work for 25 years. I had ambulance workers for 25 years in ambulance work, 14 hours night shift for 25 years. And then suddenly they're toxic people. You know, they're so bad, I can't deal with them anymore. You know, and it's normal, it's happening. So um, what's happening to us, I'm not going to go through this. Um, I'm going to send these slides to Pam, but you know, um, the rhythm that we are going through is, is embedded in us so that we can actually survive and we can work normally. And what happened, I'll just give you some few pointers here. Um, if you look at our brain, in, in 6.45 a.m. in the morning, we have the sharpest re increase of blood pressure, which means that we are ready to wake up. In 7.30, melatonin, which is, which is the hormone that makes us fall asleep and helps us sleep, stops secreting, which means that we are ready to go to the day. And then the 9 a.m., the testosterone secretion is increasing, and at the 10 a.m., we are in the highest alert. So if you want to book a meeting, book it at 10 a.m., because people are going to listen to you. And that's only what, usually that's the time we go for a coffee, isn't it? It's like, oh, God, I had enough. Um, and then, so afternoon, um, you know, at 2.30 p.m., you have a best coordination, uh, 3.30 fast reaction, 5 p.m. greatest cardio and muscle efficiency. So if you want to go to the gym, 5 p.m. is the time, yeah? Don't go at 6 a.m., you're not going to do it. Now, what's happening at night time? At 9 p.m. is the melatonin secretion starts. That's when you're getting ready to sleep. When is your night shift? It usually starts about 7, 7, 6, 30, 7, 8 p.m., yeah? So by 9 p.m., your body already shuts down, wants to go to sleep. At 2 a.m. is our deepest sleep. At 4.30 4 a.m. is the lowest body temperature, which means that we're just... Yeah. Now, the, the, they did a research with emergency medicine doctors, and they found that the, 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 um, the highest amount of mistakes are between 2 and 4 a.m., yeah? when they really, I want to sleep. And so what happens with them is the motions, when they do surgery as well, the motions are not smooth. They're jerk, you know, because you, you can't really concentrate. You With the nurses, they also found that the, you know, the reading, the, the charts and writing in the charts is also ability to do that is impaired in a night shift at that time because you're not concentrated. So they did a research um, with, um, with doctors and nurses and they had, uh, at 3 a.m., they, they allowed them to have 40 minutes sleep. And what happened after that? The, the number of mistakes went down completely. The energy level shot up absolutely uh, high. And, and um, they found out that if, if you have a night shift, you know, if you have a sleep, actually, if you are able to go and take sleep and take a nap for 40 minutes, you're actually going to recover much faster and be able to actually do that. So that's why if you, if you ever traveled overseas on the airplane, that's what they implemented with the, um, with the air hostesses and pilots because it's a high risk 
um, high risk uh, job and they actually have shifts when they're sleeping. It's not just taking rest. It's not going out watching TV. It's actually sleeping so that you can actually recover and melatonin levels are actually high. So the symptoms is burnout. Uh, how many of you, you know, <laughs> felt burned out? <laughs> um, and in, in, um, in the health services, it's a huge issue. Um, emotional dissociation, irritability, you know, the stress with job, why am I here, why, am I, why do I bother, no, no one appreciates what I'm doing, this is tough. Um, and then you have headaches, upset stomach, diabetes, cardiac problems, everything that comes with it. So, um, so what happens is, in organization, is the management finds it too difficult. And, you know, this is what we try to do, you know, wow. Uh, where do I start? Everyone is complaining. And what we're trying to do is actually um, having something like this, which is the organized approach. What, what, what we need to do is to have, you remember how we're talking about individual risk, organizational risk, and social risk. You know, we need to have a, a, a holistic, strategic approach to understand actually that we are addressing all of the risks. And it needs to be on organizational level, group level, and individual level. And then we have to have in a prevention, early intervention, and ongoing support. I know this looks very busy. I hope you find it easy to understand. Don't read, don't read any other boxes because they're all initiatives that you know organizations may decide or to do or not to do. But think about in your workplace, what are the prevention, what are the early intervention, what is the ongoing support that you're getting on the organizational level, on a team level, and individual level. The most important part here is communication engagement, reporting, analysis, monitoring, and commitment from, from the management. Commitment that yes, we are going to look after each other, and yes, this is important to me. If without that commitment from each individual in the organization, you're not going to be able to change anything. So when we're talking about monitoring strategies, if you want to do a prevention for individual risk, you need to start educating people. You need to start educating about what are the symptoms. You need to start educating what are the risks. People need to understand how the brain works. They need to understand why I want to sleep at 2 a.m. and what can I do to prevent that. Um, you know, what is resilience? How do I build that mindfulness? How do I build that? How do I know what action I need to take? How do I actually do it? And sleep education is very important. Now we have another quiz question. Sleep education is, is crucial and it's lacking. People don't really understand very much. Um, um, so the, part of the uh, sleep uh, hygiene is also diet. So there are certain foods that will actually uh, help your melatonin production, which is this hormone that makes you go to sleep. Um, and I'm going to test you now to see how much you know. So which of these do you think um, are actually increasing your melatonin production? Milk, cheese, chocolate, or pineapple? What was it? Milk? Oh, oh. So it's pineapple. Yep. So, um, yeah, so pineapple is actually increasing. You hear that? <laughs> so, pineapple is, has, is actually um, increasing melatonin production by a highest percentage. Bananas, oranges, rice, and also oats are increasing in melatonin. So if, you, if you're finishing a night shift and you're going home, the best thing to do is to put dark glasses on so you're shutting out the daylight, you're eating a pineapple, and you're going to a cool room with covered eyes and, and a dark space. And kids are out, and husbands are out, and you're by yourself, and you're not cleaning, you're not cooking, you're not thinking what the kids are going to eat. Um, so the other problem they found in the research is, is that the men um, that work in the night shifts are actually going to be able to get some sleep during the day. Females don't because we still feel like we need to cook for our kids and everyone else and we don't go to that sleep that we can actually relax. We, we take on um, duties at home. Now this, this may um, sound a bit um, 
off because I'm sure there are men that um, also do the same, but the general public um, uh, review um, found that females are more likely to engage in house activities after that. Okay, so uh, we're talking about individual mitigation strategies. Learn how, you know, the sleep hygiene, uh, mindfulness exercises to calm down and, and uh, control breathing. Now, mitigation strategies on organizational level. You know, understand what are your prevention. Um, they found that uh, you need to restrict the uh, night shifts. The best uh, le uh, length of night shift is eight hours. You can have it to 10, maximum 12. Anything over that is actually going to injure people. Um, you know, screening for sleep disorders. In, you know, start doing health checks and health skins of your staff. Um, you know, monitoring and understanding and then helping people who are actually de dealing with this problem. Um, and, and obviously dietary um, um, education and physical. There are many other things that you can do, um, you know, and sleep hygiene. Um, we usually train people and to, um, there, there are many things you can do during the night shifts to, to help yourself and um, uh, in circadian, maintaining circadian rhythm. So, um, uh, there is a melatonin treatment during the uh, daytime if you want to go to sleep, to, to actually go to sleep. Um, um, the other thing that really needs to be, I, I like to bring up with the companies and organizations that I work with, and that is that drug and alcohol issue is huge. You know, drug especially, even if people start taking um, uh, sedatives to go to sleep during the day, especially in a health environment, they become available, people start using them more and more. We need to be aware of it, we need to support these people, we need to create an environment where it's okay to report it, where it's okay to report that, hey, I wasn't coping, I started taking it and now I can't deal with it. Because otherwise, people are going to hide from us and they're going to injure themselves and others. So important thing for organizations is to create an environment where it's okay to come forward saying, I don't, I'm not dealing with it and I'm doing this and it's not helping. Um, and um, uh, is that 30 minutes or can I say more? Okay, yeah, okay. So uh, what I would ask you to take home message is um, look after your own health build your own resilience, um, understand how you can help yourself, um, understand to say to yourself sometime, it's okay, life is tough and I'm doing as much as I can, understand to be appreciative of others and help your organization build this so that they can look and you can look after yourself and others. So that's, that's me. Thank you.